Week two of Chase the Lion. Did y'all enjoy the first week? I did, but I must admit, I'm a bit afraid of our sermon series right now. You said, Dustin, why are you afraid of today's sermon series? Because it requires us to dream, and dreaming can be scary, am I right? Because when you dream, that means you naturally get your hopes up. We know what happens when we get our hopes up. For many of us, we've had our hopes crushed and taken down before. But today I'm here to say, it doesn't have to be that way. Why? Because if we're chasing after a God-sized dream, it takes a very big God in order to fulfill that dream. Uh, We learned last week that if we have a God-sized dream, that means we can't accomplish it on our own task. It requires a big God stepping up to the plate and accomplishing that dream. Yes, we work as hard as we can. I think it's important for us always to work for our dreams and for our goals. But when you're chasing a God-sized dream, it's so big, it's so massive that you need more than just a little bit of help. You need a whole lot of help. And we found last week that it was okay to chase after those dreams. Today we want to continue with that message because we know that God has given you some God-given dreams that you need to follow in your life. Here's the thing. It's scary, right? Chasing a big 800-pound lion is terrifying. But yet, if that's what God is calling us to do, we must develop courage. And today, we want to talk about that courage. But before we do, we want to talk about your life, your heritage, where you've come from up to this point. Your life tells a story. You know what that story is. Unfortunately, not everybody knows what that story is. Each and every one of you in here tonight has gone through different experiences to lead you here to this point today. Your experiences, your past has made you who you are. Whether you're the best athlete or you barely get by in school, it has made you who you are today. And my encouragement to you, don't be afraid of your past. I know for some, when we look back, it's it's hard to look at because there's a lot of pain in our past. There's a lot of scars in our past. There's a lot of bad history that we don't want to remember or think about. But what you went through in that moment has brought you forward to where you are today. And where you are today will continue to move forward until you reach the place that God would have you to go. So your heritage, your past, is what you've gone through. It's what you've experienced. It's the genes that your parents have given you. But it doesn't end there. And I'm thankful that it doesn't end there because if my life ended in my past, I would not be here today. Honestly, if I let my past dictate who I am today, I wouldn't have graduated college. I probably would have barely passed all my classes. I probably would be addicted to things I'm not supposed to be addicted to because that's what my history said. That's what the course, it set out for my life. But yet we all have a choice to make. We can either let our past and the choices of of our parents or our grandparents affect us for generations to come, or we can take hold of what God has given us, our life, and make our life count and make our life matter. Now, when I was your age, I had a choice to make. I could repeat the same old generational mistakes that my parents and that my grandparents repeated over and over and over, Or, as a teenage student, I could decide if I wanted to continue down that path or if I wanted to chart a new path for my life. And I think you know the answer today on the decision that I chose. I chose to be different. I chose to be set apart. I chose to rise above the the past failures to become who God is calling me to be. And yes, that's scary. When you're the first one out, when you're the first one in your family to graduate college, when you're the first one in your family to to go on and and get out of your city and pursue things that no one else dreamed of, it's a little bit intimidating. I'm not going to lie, there's a lot of fear. When I first started in the ministry and didn't fully know what I was doing, I was afraid, and it felt like I was just doing it all by myself. But yet God... He gave me a God-sized dream. And last time I checked, if God gave us a God-sized dream, that means that he's going to carry you through to the other point. 
So my past didn't have to hold me back because my God is the God of my future. And I'm thankful for that, aren't you? Our God is the God of our future. So tonight, this is what I want you to do before we get into tonight's scripture. I want you to think about your past. The ugly, the beautiful, I want you to think about it. And I want you to think about how it has led you to tonight. Because I promise you, God wants to do something amazing in your life tonight. And your past has gotten you to this point. When I look at my past and why I became a youth pastor, it's loud and clear. You see, as a a little fourth grade student, guess what I was involved in? I followed my brother to youth ministry as a fourth grader. Grace, you remember where you were as a fourth grader? Not really. Well, you weren't in here. You were downstairs chilling with your children's church group, having a good time, watching movies, and doing what missionettes do. But me, I joined the youth ministry as a weak, scrawny, funny-looking kid. I joined the youth ministry. So it's no wonder that I do what I do today, because it's always been there. There's no wonder that I do what I do today when I fast forward to, to my senior year. When I go to youth camp for the last time and I'm dreading it because I love youth camp, but I don't want it to be my last time, my last moment, my last youth camp altar experience. And in that time, my youth pastor uh, pulls me to the side after praying for me and said, Dustin, I believe that you can become a killer youth pastor if you choose to pursue it. That shapes you, that molds you. That's not the reason why you choose ministry because your youth pastor tells you to. That wasn't the case at all. But it was a person who believed in me so much that he would invest parts of his life into me so that I could be a better human. And if I pursue ministry after that, good. But if not, if he helped to make me a better human, that's good. You know, with those two short examples, and there are more. I mean, there are friends and family who have poured their life into me. Uh, my, my aunt and uncle, youth sponsors, taking me to church every time the doors were open. All those play a role in who I am. And honestly, the coolest part is, it's not only have they affected my life, but it will have a ripple effect for generations to come. If it wasn't for those people investing into my life, I'm probably not standing here today. I probably don't marry the person God had for me. My children probably don't follow God. Her children probably wouldn't follow God. But because one person, a select few, decided, I'm going to invest into this young man named Dustin's life. It's changed not only my life, but my family's life for generations to come. Acts of kindness, acts of saying, I'm going to make a difference in someone's life, It can go a long way, but it starts with a choice. It starts with a decision to say, you know what, God? I'm here right now. How do you want to use my life? What God-given dream have you created me to pursue? What destiny was I meant to chase after? What lion must I chase? Tonight, I think God's going to continue to open up those desires inside of your heart. But what I would have for you, what I would encourage you to have is courage and lots and lots of courage. Now, I know that's hard to do. Public speaking is something I was always terrified to do. Yes, I started at a young age in my speech class, and somehow I got a speech award even though I would stutter through half of my presentations. Don't know how that happened. I was terrified of public speaking. I was terrified of just talking in public, period. Not even on a stage or with the microphone. I was just afraid to talk to people. Maybe some of you understand what I'm going through. If I would have let that dictate my life up to this point, I'm not where I am today. It takes courage, and even more than courage, a faith in God to overcome those fears. Tonight, we want to talk about those fears. So if you have your Bible... Go ahead and look with me at 2 Samuel chapter 23. Tonight, we're looking at one verse. Before I read it, I just want to say this. I'm not convinced that our true date of death is the date listed on our death certificate. Sadly, many people die long before their hearts stop beating. 
We start dying the day we stop dreaming. And ironically, we start living the day we discover a dream worth dying for. That's from the book Chase the Lion by Mark Batterson. Amazing quote. Your life is not dependent just upon what your first stone says. It's not dependent just on your start date and on your end date. I'm here to say your life, not only now, but forever, can last a lifetime. If we choose to chase after the dream God would have for us, His dream, His purpose for our life, not our own, but His, if we chase after that dream, if we find that dream we're dying for, then we can change not only our generation, but the next generation and the next generation. Tonight we're going to look at a man who changed a generation. And it's only one verse in Scripture. This man had one verse dedita- or dedicated to him in the sacred text. And you want to know what it says? Let's read it tonight. Uh, disclaimer here, the names are ridiculously hard to pronounce. So when I butcher them, just nod, just say, you're okay, Dustin, keep going, because I can't pronounce that name either, right? Okay, let's look at this together. 2 Samuel 23, verse 8. These are the names of David's mighty warriors. Joshab, Bashebeth, a Tachmanite, was chief of the three. He raised his spear against 800 men whom he killed in one encounter. That's it. That's the verse. That one verse. I'm thankful we got through those names in one piece. But can you imagine that? The top of David's mighty men, the very chief guy, the best guy, the strongest guy, the most powerful guy was named Joshua. For tonight's lesson, we're going to call him Jay. Is that okay? We're going to call him Jay because that's easy to say. It's fun to say also. Yes. We're going to call him Jay. Jay, he raised his spear and defeated 800 men. That's 800 to 1 odds, folks. 800 to 1. Some Bibles think there might have been three. But for tonight's lesson, 800 to 1 odds. Impossible, right? Impossible. Cannot happen. That dream is too tall. It's too out there. It's too far. 800 to 1 odds. You die in that situation. You lose. Let's face it. 800 to 1 odds is kind of like putting David versus Goliath. David should lose that battle every time. But that's not what happened here. In one encounter, in one moment, in one situation, one man overcame 800 trained soldiers. And yes, it's no wonder why he became the mightiest of David's men, the king. One man, 800 versus one odds. Let's put ourselves in that situation for a moment. Can we do that? The dream that you have seems up here, and you feel right here. 800 to 1 odds. Everyone says that you cannot achieve what God is calling you out to do. They say that you cannot be who God has called you to be. The world says if you follow God, you're not going to get what you want. If you follow Him, you're going to be laughed at, you're going to be mocked, you're going to be made fun of. If you think you're going to get to where you want to go by following God, Hey, you got another thing coming. What I encourage you to do, go to school, get a business degree, excel in business, make as much money as you can, get all the cars, get all the houses, get all the the pets and and everything that you could ever want, all the bobbleheads, then you'll be happy. Don't pursue God. Here's this other path. 800 to 1 odds. Everybody says that we should lose. That by following God, we should. We will not be successful. We will not be who he has called us to be. We will fail. But this man, Joshua, Jay, he saw those odds. He knew the God that he served. He picked up his spear and he said, God, you got to be in this because if you're not in this, I'm done. He picked up his spear. 800 to 1 odds he overcame in one encounter, in one moment. One moment changed his destiny for the course of history. Now, I know that the Bible doesn't talk a whole lot about this man. I know it's just one verse. 
one verse, and when he goes across all of David's mighty men, like we learned last week, one verse, that's all he got. But that moment changed his life. He found something worth dying for. He found a king worth serving. Yes, we know King David. He was a mighty king. He loved God even though he made mistakes. But before we go on throwing spears at David, let's face it, we've made mistakes too. We understand what David went through. But David loved God. He believed in God. He was willing to serve God even if it cost him everything. Joshua found his dream and it was to be the best mighty soldier that David needed. To be the mightiest man he could be. To a one encounter, in one moment, in one situation, trust in God enough to have God come into his life and to save the day. One moment, one encounter, one situation. Should I pick up the spear and should I fight? Or should I tuck my tail and run and run away from that lion? Good moment. Many of us today, we see those odds and we think to ourselves, I can't do it. Let's face it, next week, students have too much to do on a Wednesday night. They have homework, they have activities, they have parades, they have school competitions. There is no reason we can get someone in here on a Wednesday night. The odds are stacked up against our favor. It's impossible, can't happen. But last time I checked, we serve a very mighty and powerful God. Those people you never thought would come into a church building can be here next Wednesday night. Why? Because if we have a God-sized dream, it takes a big, strong God to come and make it happen. And I think he will, because that's who we serve. Next week, my dream, a God-sized dream, is to have 50 to 75 kids in here. You look around, you see empty chairs, and you're like, Dustin, that's impossible. On our own strength, yeah, it might be. But we serve a bigger God than that. We serve a more powerful God than that. We serve a God who parted the Red Sea. We serve a God who can heal the sick. We serve a God that could see someone with leprosy and take away the spots. We serve a God who was dead in the grave for three days. And he comes back to life. So my question is this. What reason do I have to be afraid? What reason do I have to not have courage? What reason do I have to say the odds are too scary? The odds are too impossible. 800 to 1, this line's too big for me. I'm going to go home. We serve too big of a God for that. So tonight my point is this. Do not let the odds of failure dictate your faith in God. Do not let the odds of failure dictate your faith in God. The odds of serving Christ will never look good from the human eye. Because let's face it, when he tells us to go and sin no more, we look at those odds and we say, I can't do that. When he says that you can lead a mighty church that's on fire for God, who are changing their community, you think to yourself, I'm too weak of a human. I can't do that. When you think to yourself, God is calling me to be a doctor. That's a lot of years of school. How do I get to a doctor? I can't do that. It's easy to doubt ourselves. And I think we doubt ourselves consistently. But that's not who God is calling us to be. Yes, I'm encouraging you to be humble. But by being humble, it doesn't mean that you can't believe in yourself. By believing in yourself, you know what that's saying? Honestly, in my opinion, that you trust in your God enough to come through. And I know that you do. Because you're here on a Wednesday night when most people aren't. You believe in your God. You have faith in your God. You know that your God can do the impossible. And tonight... I ask you to start believing that even more and start believing in yourself. Start believing in you. Because God has created you for a purpose. God is going to give you a dream worth following. Don't doubt it. You know Rahab, you know Rahab. She was a prostitute. 
in the city of Jericho who was about to be overtaken by the Israelites. You know the story. Two spies come into the city, come into Jericho. They're about to get caught. They're about to lose their life. It takes a person with extreme kindness to save the day. Rahab finds them. She hides them. She kind of gives the guards a run around trying to get them in a different part of the city than what these two spies are in. Because if these two spies are caught, their life is gone. Just like that. You know, no questions asked. They're done. Rahab sees them in their situation. Says, I can help. I can help these two men. She hides them. She lets them go on their way. They make it back to camp. On one condition. Rahab asks, hey, I know that you're about to probably come in and win this war. To defeat Jericho. To, to, to win this battle. You serve the proper God. This is what I ask. Since I risked my neck to save your life, when you march around the city and it collapses, when you penetrate an impenetrable city, will you remember me? Will you remember my family? Will you remember us? It takes a lot of courage to step out and say that, right? A lot of courage. Her city was about to be destroyed, and here she's asking for mercy in war. Yeah, that just doesn't happen. But because she showed kindness, the spies took note of that. Go to their leader. Next thing you know, Rahab's family is saved. And guess what? Out of Rahab's family line, there's King David, a king. From a prostitute, next thing you know, you have a king generations down the line. Impossible odds. Not supposed to happen. Here's an even cooler thought. Out of King David's line, fast forward, you have Jesus Christ, the Savior, the King of this world. If you trace those lines back, you find Rahab. 800 to 1 odds. But one act of kindness impacted generations to come. So I know the odds are great of achieving your God-given dream. I know they are. But don't fear those odds. Courage. Chase the lion instead of running away from the lion. Because God knows what he's doing. And if God is giving you a dream and you're working and you're chasing after that dream, if you're giving it everything you got, he's going to come through. Just like he's going to come through next Wednesday night. Mark my words. We serve a powerful God. And I'm thankful that we do. So don't let the odds of failure dictate your faith in God. Like that of Joshua, you might be one encounter away from your destiny. It might be an off-the-wall conversation, an interest or a passion, a crazy idea, or a glance across a crowded room. But one moment can dramatically impact your life. For many of you, tonight might be that moment. I had my fair share of moments like that. I've mentioned a couple, but I want to share with you another one. I graduate college, right? You're supposed to jump right into your career, right? That's what people say. That didn't happen. I worked at as a lifeguard in a Bed Bath & Beyond, then at a drugstore, just trying to make my way, trying to figure things out. It was a year that I was terrified of. It was a year that I felt inadequate because I wasn't doing what I thought God was calling me to. But a year where I grew so much, that year... I believe, is when God implanted a very important God-given dream in my life. I shared with you last week a dream of pastoring a church one day who is very passionate about the things of God and also uses things like physical fitness to bring people closer to Christ. Now, although I still haven't worked out all the details yet, I do know that that year, that's what kept me going. The ability to lead people to Christ and use fitness to do it, there was something there. And as I continue to look at my life in ministry, uh, you know, my first situation in ministry in Seguin 
guess what? My greatest ministry wasn't necessarily on a stage on a Wednesday night, but it was actually at Anytime Fitness in a gym where people are all around. It was a part of a running club that we had run together. And in those moments, I got to stand for Christ. It was on a volleyball court on a Monday night when everybody's cussing and drinking and doing all kinds of stuff. It was one man standing for what he thought was right. People noticed. People noticed. And then even as I moved and transitioned to Flower Mound, guess what? Early on in the spring, we ran 13.1 miles to raise money for Speed the Light. For me, fitness has been a part of my ministry journey. Leading a church with a ministry focus, with a gym-like and running focus, with a fitness feel to it, that's a God-sized dream. Something I can't do on my own. But it's a dream we're chasing after because it's a God-given dream after all. The odds are not in my favor. The odds of something like that succeeding might be slim, might be 800 to 1. But if God is calling me to it, if that's what I was created for and designed for, then God's going to see it through. Tonight, what's your God-given dream? What were you created for? What were you designed for? Do we know? If we don't, take courage. One moment can change your history. This one encounter changed Joshua's history forever. He became one of David's mightiest men. One moment for you can change your history. So what do we do? We keep our eyes open. We look for that moment. We keep our faith and our eyes on God because we know that in the proper time, He's going to drop a little dream in your life. And then you're going to race forward in life. And then He's going to drop that dream again in your life the way He did for me back in March at a minister's retreat. Don't fear the plans God has for you. Don't fear the plans God has for you, even though they might be scary. Rahab had every reason to fear. Or she could stand. Stand and do what's right. Stand and save the day, and she did that. I want to read you another quote from Mark Batterson. Where the ripple effect of kindness ends, no one knows. And the same is true of love and grace and courage. Give it a generation or two or 18. And it might just be the inciting incident that changes the course of history. You might change the course of history through one act of kindness. You might just be loving on someone one day, you know, giving them a $5 bill, sitting with them at lunch or, or whatever. Doing something nice for someone else and it might change that person's life for the rest of time. They might go on to be a billionaire and give $5 million of that to missions. Change people's life. We don't know the actions that we have, what role they might play in the course of history. Therefore, if we live each moment, each second, each chance that we get with the kindness and the grace that God has given us, think of the generations that you could impact long term. When my youth pastor was ministering to me at youth camp, he wasn't thinking about my great-grandchildren or even further down the line. He was just thinking of ministering to the one. But guess what? Because of his ministry, my kids are better for it. When I was sitting that year away from ministry, away from school, I thought I was failing. But really, God was preparing something for me to not only impact my life for the course of history, but maybe to impact your life. Maybe to impact the life of the people that I haven't even come into contact with. Don't fear what God wants to do with you. And guess what? It can start now. It can start right now. In your school system, where you are, you can have a dramatic impact where you are. You can change a generation, not because of how great you are, but because how great our God is. So don't fear. Don't fear the challenge. Have courage. Trust in your God. Let him come through. Jay, if I can have you come to the guitar tonight. Let us not grow weary in doing good. Let us not grow weary. For at the proper time, we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. 
Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people. Like Rahab. Like this man, Joshua, who 801, picks up the spear and makes a difference. Your time is now. As you notice, there's flyers all over your chairs. This wasn't planned in tonight's message, but I want you to look at those. Look at the flyers in your hands. Those represent four people. Or could represent eight or 16, depending on how many you want to take. What if this coming up week, you could play a role in someone else's life that will change their life for the course of history? You're saying, Dustin, that's a lot of pressure. Pressure I don't want to handle. Pressure I'm going to take off your shoulders. Yes, I encourage you to invite people. I encourage you to pass out the flyers. I encourage you to get people's attention. Let's take back Halloween. But know this. It's God who changes people, not us. It's God who, who saves the day, not us. It's God who makes the dreams come true, not necessarily us. We got to do the work. We got to pray. We got to work hard. We got to make the grade. We got to try. We got to push ourselves forward. But ultimately, we know if it's a God sized dream, God's the one who brings that dream to completion. Why do I have to be afraid? You said, Dustin, why does God do that? Why doesn't God just give you a dream that you can accomplish on your own? My thought is this. If he gave you a dream that you could accomplish on your own, that means it's up to you. That means that this life is up to you, that you are in direct control of your future. But how does God get glory in that? I think God receives the most glory when we are relying on him to do the impossible. And then he comes through in the clutch. That's who our God is. 800 to 1 odds, God comes through. That's who he is. That's who we serve. So tonight, have courage. Have courage. Chase the lion. Have courage. I know the dreams are scary and tall. But last time I checked, God has overcome the sin of this world. He can, he can do anything. That's who we serve. When we become passionate about the things God is passionate about and sacrifice to follow those dreams, we can create ripples in the kingdom that last forever. If last week was about overcoming our fears and dreaming again, this week's sermon is about having the courage to make those dreams a reality. We can do what God has asked us to do because of the God that we serve.